Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels sang and said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. You know, at this time of the year, we always talk about the birth of Jesus, and man, I think that's great. There are so many wonderful things about that, but people often think that this is talking about peace among men. And at Christmas time, they'll say, It's Christmas, you know, don't fight. Uh, we need to operate in love. Well, we need to operate in love all year long, whether it's Christmas or not. But they put this emphasis on this because of a misunderstanding, thinking that when the angels said that uh, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace towards man, they think it's peace among men, and they think that Jesus came to bring us all into harmony. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, he says, Think not that I came to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace, but to send division and divide families and stuff. People are going to be divided because of what he did. So I think that many times we just use these verses to kind of create a mood, a, uh, an atmosphere that is not really a biblical atmosphere, that we just all need to operate in love and sit around and love each other. Well, certainly we're supposed to operate in love, but that's not what the angels were singing about. So I've been trying to explain that this is talking about the war between God and man is over, and I've been emphasizing specifically most of the time I've spent in Isaiah showing how that God took all of His wrath and put it upon Jesus. And He paid such a price that there should now be no separation not a partial separation. Some people think, well, I'm not going to be separated in the sense that I'll go to hell through Jesus. I've accepted salvation, and I'm not going to go to hell. But man, if I mess up, I can't expect God's blessing. I can't expect His joy. I can't, I can't expect peace or anything like that. That's not true. You haven't placed the proper value on what Jesus did. Jesus paid such a price that there's nothing left for you to pay. You either believe and just receive as a gift, or if you start trying to earn it, then you do without. It doesn't work that way. And I've been using these verses. Let me go back to Isaiah chapter 54. And it says in verse 7, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Through the Old Testament, there was rejection. There was punishment. There was imputing people's sins unto them, and because of that, God dealt with people according to their sins. Now, there was grace under the Old Covenant if a person would go through the sacrificial system and do certain things, but it uh, certainly wasn't automatic. You had to access that grace through those sacrifices. In verse 8, it says, "...in a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer." Again, these are prophetic scriptures talking about what would happen when Jesus came and reconciled us to God. And so looking at the whole human history for a small time, from about 2,000 years after the fall of man, that's when the flood came. Well, the flood actually came at 1,556 years after the fall of man. And then the time of Moses when the law was given was about 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve. So for the first 2,000 years, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Then under the law for approximately 2,000 years, God did hold people's sins against them. There's a reason for that. I've got an entire another teaching on that entitled The True Nature of God that will explain that in a lot more detail. And then since Jesus came, He has now reconciled us unto God, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. So if you look at the total, 6,000 plus years since Adam and Eve fell, there was only 2,000 years that He was actually imputing people's sins unto them and dealing with them in this harshness. The majority of time, He's been gracious unto us, and so this is saying, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, talking about that law period of time. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And then this, this is just awesome. Man, I pray that you take the effort to think about this. I know some of you are getting ready to go to work or you're doing something else, but this deserves your undivided attention. 
It says, for this is as the waters of Noah unto me. What is that talking about? Did you know when the Lord flooded the earth with this flood of Noah, after that was over, he made a covenant with Noah. And he said, I'll never again destroy the earth with a flood. And there's two types of covenants in the old covenant. One is called a theke, and the other one is a diatheke. The word dia means through or in conjunction. So it's talking about one of those covenants is dependent upon your participation. The other covenant is an unconditional covenant to where it doesn't matter what you do. This is just God making a covenant. He says, I swear by myself that this is what I'm going to do. And the covenant that he made with Noah was an unconditional covenant. He didn't say, if the people on the earth never provoke me again, and if they never get back to the same level of debauchery that was in the days of Noah, then I'll never destroy the earth with a flood. He didn't do that. He just said, I'll never destroy the earth with a flood. There was no conditions on it. There was nothing to be meant. That's an unconditional covenant. So this is what he's referring to. And he says, this covenant that he's talking about right here, the prophecy about Jesus and how it would open up relationship with God through Jesus, he says, this covenant is going to be like that covenant I made with Noah, an unconditional covenant. And he goes on to say, for this is the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Again, man, use your head for something besides a hat rack. Think about this. This is awesome. In the same way that God said, I'll never destroy the earth with the flood. I don't care how bad things get. He'll never send a worldwide flood again. It's an unconditional covenant. He said, in the exact same way, I am swearing to you that when this Messiah comes, Jesus, and he purchased redemption for us, that I will never be wroth with you nor rebuke you again. Man, that is nearly too good to be true. Did you know, I bet you most of you, if you've gone to church very much, you could, you could remember some kind of a testimony where somebody got up and talked about how they were disobeying God and yet God just wouldn't leave them alone and God was on them and God rebuked them and God did this and God was angry with them. I remember one service I was at up in uh, Ohio and a man stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, God is angry. God is displeased. God is is uh, I, he just went on and talked about how God is so messed, mad at him. And then he ended by saying, and besides all of that, I am not here. <laughs> it, was, it was weird. I had to get up and rebuke this guy and say, hey, that wasn't God because of this right here. God said he wouldn't be angry with us nor rebuke us. Now, the Lord will reprove us over sin, but it's not for the purpose of condemnation or punishment. He placed all of our punishment upon Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 2, it says, well, let me turn over and just read this so that I don't misquote it. But Romans chapter 8, verse 1 is the famous passage of Scripture about that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 2, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh that's through our flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. God judged Jesus. God put our condemnation into the flesh of Jesus so that there should be no condemnation, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So I've heard many people just talk about the anger and the wrath of God. God will show us sin in our life, but not for the purpose of condemnation, not for the purpose of punishment. It's to warn us. He'll say, look, I forgive you. You're forgiven. This is not going to cause me to turn away from you, but you are opening up a door to the devil. You are making yourself susceptible. Satan is going to come steal, kill, and destroy, and he will show us things that we're doing for our own benefit, to try and turn us away, never as punishment. It's never rebuking 
are being angry at us again. That's what these verses say. And yet I can guarantee you there are, I'd say hundreds of thousands minimum, maybe millions of people watching this program right now who you feel God's displeasure. You feel His anger. You feel like God is rebuking you. It's not God. It's either your own conscience that is condemning you and you haven't cleansed it by the blood of the Lamb like it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, or it's the devil that is coming out and condemning you. But God said that when this atonement comes through the Messiah, that He would never be wroth with us or rebuke us. Again, this doesn't mean He's going to sit there and just say, you're awesome all of the time. He's going to tell you when you do things wrong because He doesn't want to see you trapped by the devil. He doesn't want to see Satan come against you. And so He'll warn you and tell you not to do things, but it's never uh, rebuke. It's never condemnation. He's not angry at any of us if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord. Now, those who haven't accepted Jesus, He's extending grace towards you right now, but there is coming a time that if you don't accept Jesus, that the wrath of God will come to pass in your life. But for those of us that have accepted the Lord, He's never going to be wroth with us nor rebuke us. And then the next verse says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that have mercy on thee. Again, man, if you would think about this, what a great promise this is. You know, I live in Colorado, and right outside of this building, you can look and see Pikes Peak. It's just beautiful. It's right there in front of us. And this says, as long as the mountains are here, that God's kindness and His peace will not depart from us, that the mountains will depart and be cast into the sea before God's covenant of peace is withdrawn from us. I can tell you, some of you might live in a place that there are no mountains and you can't see, but I can look outside and I can see Pikes Peak. It's still there. That means that this covenant of peace has not been removed. God has not changed. And if you don't feel the peace and the love and the acceptance of God, it is not because God isn't giving. It's because you haven't renewed your mind yet. And sad to say, a lot of the Christian church today is still preaching the old covenant that every time you sin, God is angry at you. God's wrath is going to come upon you and things like that. That is not what this says. Let me go back and just read this again. This is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. God has given us a covenant of peace, and it's all based on what Jesus did. Jesus paid the price so that the war is over between God and man. That doesn't mean that you've quit sinning. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've just become somehow or another this pure as wind-driven snow person and that there is no iniquity in us. Each one of us fails in many ways all of the time. Not only what you know, when we break a law and do something that we shouldn't, but we all fail to be the person we're supposed to be. There's none of us that love God as much as we should. There's none of us that love our mate as much as we should. There's none of us that are as considerate of other people as we should be. We just fail in many different ways. All of us. All of us. And if you are not understanding this covenant of peace, that God gave us. This is what those angels were singing about. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. They were talking about this covenant of peace is coming to where all of our sin is placed on Jesus so that all that's left from God is just love and acceptance. He will never be angry with us. He will never uh, rebuke us. This covenant of peace will never be removed from us regardless of our performance. Boy, this just rubs a lot of religious people the wrong way. Are you saying that you can go live in sin? What I'm saying is that your sin doesn't change God's attitude towards you. 
BUT I AM NOT SAYING THAT SIN uh, IS OKAY AND THAT YOU CAN JUST LIVE ANY WAY YOU WANT TO. SIN DOESN'T CHANGE GOD'S HEART TOWARDS YOU, BUT SIN WILL CHANGE YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD. SIN WILL OPEN YOU UP TO SATAN. IT GIVES SATAN A LEGAL RIGHT TO COME INTO YOUR LIFE. YOU SUBMIT IT TO HIM. IT SAYS IN ROMANS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 16, IT SAYS, KNOW YE NOT THAT TO WHOM YE YIELD YOURSELVES, SERVANTS TO OBEY, HIS SERVANTS YOU ARE, TO WHOM YE OBEY, WHETHER OF SIN UNTO DEATH OR OF OBEDIENCE UNTO RIGHTEOUSNESS. IF YOU GO OUT AND LIVE IN SIN, YOU JUST GO OUT AND DO SOMETHING THAT YOU KNOW IS WRONG AND YET YOU'RE GOING TO DO IT ANYWAY, IT'S JUST LIKE YOU'VE OPENED UP YOUR ARMS AND SAY, SATAN, SHOOT YOUR BEST SHOT. JUST COME AT ME. YOU HAVE DROPPED YOUR SHIELD OF FAITH AND YOU ARE JUST EXPOSED AND SATAN HAS TOTAL ACCESS TO YOU. AND ACCORDING TO JOHN CHAPTER 10, VERSE 10, THE THIEF COMETH NOT BUT FOR TO STEAL, TO KILL, AND TO DESTROY. SATAN IS THE THIEF. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, HE'S GOING ABOUT AS A ROARING LION, SEEKING WHOM HE MAY DEVOUR. AND IF YOU DROP YOUR SHIELD OF FAITH IN JESUS AND YOU GO OUT AND JUST LIVE IN SIN, HE'S GOING TO COME AND DEVOUR YOU. HE'S GOING TO TAKE ADVANTAGE. SO NO, IT'S NOT THAT WE GO LIVE IN SIN. I AM NOT ADVOCATING LIVING IN SIN. I KNOW I'M SAYING A LOT OF THINGS THAT ARE CONTRARY TO THE TYPICAL RELIGIOUS CONCEPTS. AND THERE'S PEOPLE THAT WILL TAKE THINGS THAT I'VE SAID AND TAKE IT OUT OF CONTEXT AND SAY THAT I'M SAYING IT DOESN'T MATTER, YOU KNOW, ALL OF YOUR SIN'S FORGIVEN, SO YOU CAN GO LIVE IN SIN. IT JUST DOESN'T MATTER WHAT YOU DO. I'M TELLING YOU THAT IF YOU ARE SAYING THAT AGAINST WHAT I'M SAYING, YOU EITHER ARE OUT AND OUT LYING, YOU ARE OUT TO MISREPRESENT ME AND YOU ARE, are, are LYING, OR YOU'RE DECEIVED. YOU'VE TOTALLY MISSED WHAT I'M SAYING. I AM NOT ADVOCATING SIN. BUT I AM SAYING THAT THAT SIN DOES NOT CHANGE GOD'S ATTITUDE TOWARDS YOU. IT'LL CHANGE YOUR ATTITUDE TOWARDS GOD. IT'LL GIVE SATAN AN INROAD INTO YOUR LIFE. SATAN WILL COME IN AND EAT YOUR LUNCH AND POP THE BAG. SIN WILL COST YOU MORE THAN YOU WANT TO PAY. IT'LL TAKE YOU FURTHER THAN YOU WANT TO GO, AND IT'LL KEEP YOU LONGER THAN YOU WANT TO STAY. YOU DO NOT WANT TO LIVE IN SIN. BUT GOD PAID FOR ALL OF YOUR SINS, PAST, PRESENT, AND EVEN THE SINS YOU HADN'T COMMITTED YET. I HAVEN'T GOT TO EXPLAINING THAT, BUT I'M GOING TO AS WE CONTINUE THROUGH THIS SERIES FROM HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 AND CHAPTER 10 THAT YOU HAVE BEEN FORGIVEN OF ALL SIN, EVEN SINS THAT HAVEN'T BEEN COMMITTED YET. THAT DOESN'T FREE YOU TO GO LIVE IN SIN. IT JUST FREES YOU FROM THE CONDEMNATION, THE GUILT, THE SEPARATION THAT CAME BECAUSE OF YOUR SIN. JESUS BORE THAT PUNISHMENT, AND YOU ARE NOT GOING TO HAVE GOD SEPARATE HIMSELF FROM YOU BECAUSE OF YOUR SIN ONCE YOU MAKE JESUS YOUR PERSONAL SAVIOR. ONCE YOU ACCEPT THE FORGIVENESS THAT IS AVAILABLE THROUGH JESUS, HE FORGIVES YOU OF ALL OF YOUR SIN, PAST, PRESENT, AND FUTURE, AND YOU NOW RELATE TO GOD JUST BASED ON FAITH. THERE IS THIS COVENANT OF PEACE. MAN, I COULD JUST EXPOUND ON THIS FOREVER. MOST CHRISTIANS DON'T HAVE A LOT OF PEACE. THE ONLY TIME MOST PEOPLE FEEL PEACE, FEEL AT PEACE IN THEIR RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD IS WHEN YOU'VE DONE EVERYTHING RIGHT, WHICH IS VERY SELDOM, AMEN. AND BECAUSE OF IT, MOST PEOPLE DON'T REALLY FEEL A LOT OF THE PEACE OF GOD BECAUSE OUR OWN HEART CONDEMNS US. OUR OWN HEART SHOWS US THAT WE COULD BE MORE. WE COULD DO BETTER THAN WHAT WE'RE DOING. AND SO VERY FEW CHRISTIANS REALLY FEEL TOTAL PEACE WITH GOD. AND IT'S BECAUSE THEY DON'T UNDERSTAND THE THINGS THAT WE'RE TALKING ABOUT. They, THEY DON'T UNDERSTAND THAT THROUGH JESUS, GOD PLACED ALL OF HIS WRATH ON JESUS, AND HE'S NOT ANGRY WITH YOU IF YOU'VE ACCEPTED JESUS AS YOUR LORD. EVEN IF YOU HAVEN'T ACCEPTED JESUS, HE'S EXTENDING MERCY TOWARDS YOU, AND HE PAID FOR YOUR SINS THROUGH WHAT JESUS DID, AND HE'S WILLING TO TOTALLY FORGIVE YOU. IT DOESN'T MATTER HOW BAD YOU'VE BEEN. ALL YOU GOT TO DO IS JUST RECEIVE WHAT JESUS MADE AVAILABLE TO YOU. ROMANS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 9 SAYS THAT IF YOU WILL CONFESS WITH YOUR MOUTH THE LORD JESUS AND BELIEVE IN YOUR HEART THAT GOD RAISED HIM FROM THE DEAD, YOU SHALL BE SAVED. FOR WITH THE HEART MAN BELIEVES UNTO RIGHTEOUSNESS AND WITH THE MOUTH CONFESSION IS MADE UNTO SALVATION. SO JESUS HAS ALREADY PAID FOR ALL OF THE SINS, BUT IT'S NOT AUTOMATIC. YOU HAVE TO RECEIVE IT. HOW DO YOU RECEIVE IT? BY MAKING JESUS YOUR LORD. AND THAT'S MORE THAN JUST MOUTHING THOSE WORDS. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT THAT YOU ARE 
turning your life over to Jesus. You are trusting Him. You're making Him your Savior. You're saying, Jesus, I am not, or you're saying, God the Father, I am not approaching you on the basis of my goodness, but I come in the name of Jesus. I make Jesus my Lord. I receive what He did for me. And when you believe that, confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. Romans 10, 9 says, You shall be saved. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. And once that happens, God relates to you spirit to spirit. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You can't approach God based on your physical body, your actions, and your mental, emotional thoughts. You have to approach Him in spirit. When you get born again, you receive a new spirit and you have to worship God spirit to spirit. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on your goodness. It's based on what Jesus did. And when you get born again, He gives you that righteousness and makes you a brand new person in Christ Jesus where old things have passed away and all things have become new. That's not talking about your physical body. Your physical body isn't changed. It's not talking about your mental, emotional part. That doesn't automatically change. It's talking about in the Spirit. You become this brand new person. And if you approach God through Jesus and what He did for you in your spirit man, then you approach Him in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24. And you can come before Him based on what God has done. That's what you've got to do is, is access this covenant of peace. This is what these angels were singing about. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. The only way you can have peace with God is through faith in the Lord Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you are trying to earn peace with God through your own actions, there will never be peace because your own actions will never be good enough. You just have to humble yourself and receive it by faith. You have access by faith into this grace wherein you stand is what it says in the next verse, Romans 5, 2.